Shalom Hadavarniks. Welcome to Hadavar Messianic Ministries and our School of Biblical and Jewish Studies. We're studying Messianic Jewish history, and this is session number six. So let's uh, take a look at session number five and review quickly where we were last session. <clears throat> last session we talked about the Christianized Jews, the Meshumadim, the destroyers, as we were known back then and as the uh, ultra-Orthodox still call us today. Uh, we talked about Sixtus of Siena, Philip Joseph, Asher of Juden, and the infamous Johannes Pfefferkorn. Then we moved to the 5th and the 18th century. When we were moving the 15th and 18th century and talking about the Meshemadim, then we talked about the status of the Jewish community. And the summary of the Jewish status are these points. The church had decided that it was the new Israel. Uh, land ownership was forbidden to Jewish people. Guild membership was forbidden to Jewish people. A Jewish guy could not marry a Christian or a gal could not marry a Christian. Uh, the Jewish person had to wear special clothing and the Jewish person had to wear identifying badges. Well, the status of the Jewish community was not very good, and neither was the experience of the Jewish community. They faced libels. For example, host desecration. This came about due to the Roman Catholics' uh, doctrine that the bread and the wine become the actual body and blood of the Messiah in the Eucharist. And so therefore Jewish people, they said, would come in and they would stab the Eucharist. And because it was the actual body and blood of Christ, it would bleed. So that was the, the um, libel, the, the host desecration. Then the blood libel, that the Jewish people needed Christian blood to mix in with the recipe for, to making their Passover matzah. So here's a picture of a young boy being bled and his blood being gathered to mix in with the matzah. Again, a, a, a lie of quite great proportions. And then well poisoning, especially when the diseases were going through the community because the Jewish community had better health than the Christian community and so they were accused of poisoning the wells. So the experience of the Jewish community was libels and massacres and Easter mobs and the Crusades, you know, convert or die. And then uh, Christianized Jews, we talked about Christianized Jews. They were Christianized for a number of reasons. One, by compulsion, they were forced to become Christians. Or convenience, so they could join the economy uh, more easily. Or some were Christianized by conviction, some became actual believers. So the methods that were used to Christianize Jews, governmental degree. The government threatened you with expulsion if you didn't become a, a Jew, I mean, become a, a Christian. We'll kick you Jews out of our country. Or they were threatened with execution, convert or die. <laughs> or they were threatened with kidnapping. Oh, you, do, you can stay a Jew, but we'll kidnap your kids. We'll take your kids and make them into Christians. Pretty tough stuff. Then literary works were used, such as the literary works, the letters of Rabbi Samuel, and the dialogue of Peter and Moses. And public disputations were also utilized, where the rabbis had to defend themselves and their doctrine against the priests. And not only public disputations, but compulsory sermons were, were forced upon the community, where they could, had to come and sit and listen to an evangelistic sermon and even bribery was used. So the Christianized Jews faced great difficulties. They had to face renunciations. They had to renounce all things Jewish. They had to swear oaths against Jewishness and take on a Christian name. With renunciations came suspicion and envy. Uh, nobody was really convinced that they were true Christians. Now, we, then we looked at the impact of Christianized Jews and some of their significant leaders, Avner of Bergo, Solomon ha Halevi of Bergo, and the Pierleone family. Uh, then we began to look at the modern Messianic Jewish movement and Jewish missions and the causes for Jewish missions. The Reformation restored the gospel. Millennial theology restored a place for the nation Israel. Spiritual revivals restored personal spiritual experience. 
and the modern missionary movement restored the need to reach particular people groups. That was led by people like Adoniram Johnson, uh, Judson, excuse me, and William Carey, and some of the missionary organizations that got formed, the London Mish Society for Promoting Christian Knowledge Among the Jews, and the founder was a Jewish Christian, Joseph Samuel Christian Friedrich Frey. And then there's the Hebrew Christian testimony to Israel. The founder was David Barron, David Barron. And he succinctly stated the distinctive of his ministry. The distinctive, our testimony is that of Jews to Jews, not of Gentiles to Jews, but of Jews to Jews. Then the American Society, Society for Ameliorating the Condition of the Jews. And uh, Joseph Samuel Christian Friedrich Frey came to America and started an American version of that ministry. The Chicago Hebrew Mission, eventually known as the American Messianic Fellowship, uh, the founder was William Blackstone. The Brownsville Mission to the Jews, also known as the Williamsburg Mission to the Jews and the American Board of Missions to the Jews, and today the name is the Chosen People Ministries. Its founder was Rabbi Leopold Cohen. He is quite a guy. And the significance of Chosen People Ministries is that it gave birth to a number of other ministries, American Association of Jewish Evangelism, Friends of Israel, Jews for Jesus, Ariel Ministries. And the, we talked about the methods of the missions. And this now brings us to the new material. After looking at the methods of the missions, we'll now look at the results, the results of their work. Uh, <clears throat> The basically, along with the, with the growth of Jewish missions, came the rebirth of the Messianic Jewish movement and some of the characteristics of the movement. First of all, growth of outreach, growth of outreach. It was a growing movement. In 1927, there were approximately 724 missionaries seeking to reach Jewish people around the world in approximately 100 organizations. And so the outreach was very effective. It was, there was a sizable accomplishment. Estimates say that by the end of the 19th century, there were over 250,000 Jewish people who believed in Jesus, over a quarter of a million Jewish people. Now, according to the Universal Jewish Encyclopedia of 1941, however, these figures are manifestly too low. So that's good news. The, uh, the missions were even more effective than we can count on. Actually, the number of converts during this period must have been considerably higher. And that Dr. Hugh Schoenfield, in his book, The History of Jewish Christianity, makes this comment. He says, it is striking that when all compulsion and necessity for Christian baptism was removed, there was an increase, not a diminution, diminution of conversions. The spirit that had steadily resisted threats and persecutions was ready to surrender to love. But the sad facts of the case are that most of these believers were in Poland and Germany and Russia. Most were destroyed by Hitler as part of his genocide. But the result of the missions was a significant contribution to the body of Messiah. A number of significant Jewish people were one to the Lord. And so here are four very significant Messianic Jewish uh, missionaries. First one was Joseph Wolf, 1795 to 1862. He became a missionary with the London Jewish Society. He traveled the world. Many books call him the greatest Jewish missionary who ever lived. He was a wanderer who traveled all over the world, opening mission stations. The second individual is Samuel Isaac Joseph Sheroshewski, 1831 to 1906. He was one to the Lord at a missionary Passover Seder. At a Passover Seder, he saw the truth. He became a missionary, an Anglican bishop to China. He translated the Bible into Chinese, into Mandarin Chinese. And he was a great linguist, but he never lost his heart for his people. He always retained membership in the Hebrew Christian Alliance. Now, a third individual was Michael Solomon Alexander, 1799 to 1845. 
He was a missionary to the Jews with the London Jewish Society. When it was determined that they should establish a Jewish bishopric of the Anglican Church in Jerusalem, he was selected as the bishop. He became the first Jewish bishop of Jerusalem since the second century. It's also significant in that he led a group of Jewish believers to combat the blood libel in the early 1840s. Around 1840 or 1841, a charge of ritual murder was raised against the Jews living in Damascus. <clears throat> Michael Alexander had a document written by Messianic Jews asserting that the blood libel was false. I mean, having been Jewish, we should have known, right? The Christian Jews led by Alexander said, you know, we're, we were raised Jewish, we're, we're Christians now, and we know that this charge of, of uh, ritual murder is false. It's not part of the Jewish community. So they published the document opposing the libel, and it was well received by the Jewish community because it was in their defense. And now, number four, Alfred Edersheim. Alfred Edersheim wrote The Life, of, Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah and various other books, such as Sketches of Jewish Social Life in the Days of Christ, and Bible History, Old Testament, and The Temple, Its Ministry and Services. These are some of the books he wrote, and many of his books are still available, still in print. They're classics, and if you can get hold of a Alfred Edersheim book, buy it, read it, keep it in your library. Now, Alfred Edersheim was a missionary, a pastor, and an accomplished professor in England. He was the most noted Hebrew Christian scholar of the 19th century. And again, we still read his books today and use his books today. So uh, anything by Alfred Edersheim should be in your library. All right, so there's the significant Messianic Jews, but there were some problems with the missions, with the, some problems. Uh, many of the Jewish people lost their identity once they were one to the Lord. That was one significant problem. They just assimilated into conventional congregations rather than continuing to identify with their people and to reach them for the Lord. So as a result, Messianic Jewish associations were, <coughs> were created. And there were a number of attempts at forming Hebrew Christian, uh, Hebrew Christian associations at the beginning of the 19th century. The precursors were the, the association B'nai Avraham in 1813, and the Abrahamic Society in 1835. But neither of these organizations got very far. They probably didn't succeed because they were associated with the British or London Jewish societies. And a strong affiliation with one organization makes it very hard for, to unite unaffi unaffiliated people under the banner of that organization. But alliances did form. And so the alliances, we begin with the British Hebrew Christian Alliance in 1865. This is the first one, 1865. That was followed by the American Hebrew Christian Alliance in 1950 in the United States here, spilled over to uh, the New World, the American Hebrew Christian Alliance. And then thirdly, the International Hebrew Christian Alliance in 1925. And so the goal of this organization and the others was to form an international umbrella for all the national associations or alliances that had developed. So the purposes for the International Alliance, number one, the spiritual growth of Jewish believers. And number two, fellowship and unity among Jewish believers. Number three, they sought to maintain Jewish identity, and deal with that problem. Fourth, they wanted to support Zionism, which in the 1890s was a very, very, very strong aspect of the alliance. Next, they wanted to, def to combat anti-Semitism they wanted to promote Jewish evangelism, sharing of the gospel among the Jews, and they wanted to provide benevolence and scholarship aid to Jewish believers. But there were problems, two significant problems in the alliances. One was constant internal bickering. You know, you get two Jews together, you get three opinions, right? We love to bicker, we love to argue, and that is really a handicap. That's really a handicap. But the next issue is also very, very important. 
a second generation loss of identity. The missions won Jewish people to the Lord, but the Jewish people lost their identity. They saw a need to correct this, and so Jewish believers formed Jewish Christian associations so they could keep their Jewish identity through various means. And they succeeded in that, but their children didn't go along with it. The children were raised in the churches, and they lost their identity. So there was a second generation loss of Jewish identity. And that's exactly what happened to me. I wasn't raised in the church. I was raised uh, uh, in a secular environment, uh, actually an agnostic environment. But uh, uh, being, a, being Jewish meant absolutely nothing to me. You know, my mother wanted me to identify as being Jewish. You know, I remember as a teenager having an argument with my mother. You know, that happens when you're a teenager. And I remember she stood over me and she said, but you're Jewish, but you're Jewish, you know. So she wanted my brother and I to identify um, as Jews, but we really didn't have any Jewish identity as teenagers and beyond. All right, so the next step was for Hebrew Christian churches and Messianic congregations to get formed. This was the, the next uh, step in the progression. Now, they at first, they were usually called Hebrew Christian churches, and here's an early logo of a Hebrew Christian church. Today, we call them Messianic congregations, but <laughs> they're local churches. They're local churches. Just depends upon their cultural uh, emphasis and leaning. Now, the precursors, the precursors to the movement. Uh, number one, Rabbi Isaac Lichtenstein. Rabbi Isaac Lichtenstein, 1824 to 1909. Now, Rabbi Lichtenstein was a rabbi in Hungary. He was a rabbi in Hungary who became a believer, and he stayed in his pulpit and won his congregation, most of his congregation, to the Lord. For a number of years, he maintained leadership in that congregation despite opposition from the Jewish community. He never submitted to Christian baptism, but he did immerse himself in a mikvah, in a, in a mikvah, in, a, in an immer, a ritual immersion. Now, why? Why did he do this? Well, that's because baptism is the dividing line in the rabbinic mind. You know, you can believe anything you want, and you're still considered Jewish. You can believe in Hare Krishna, you can believe in this, you can believe in that. Yeah, that's fine. You know, as long as you wear a kippah and maybe attend a synagogue once in a while, you're okay. But if you believe in Jesus, well, that's okay, but don't get baptized. Have you been baptized? No, bah, you're still Jewish. Have you been baptized? Yes, I got baptized. Get out of here. Get out of here. You're no longer Jewish. <laughs> it's the dividing line. Baptism is the dividing line. And so he didn't want to stretch that um, his relationship with the community to the breaking point. I'm sure that's why he did it. So he immersed himself in a mikvah, but it wasn't formal Christian baptism. Now, the second individual who was a precursor to the Messianic movement was Joseph Rabinowitz, 1837 to 1899. He established a congregation in Kishinev in Russia, now known as Moldova, uh, Kishinev, called Israelites of the New Covenant. Now, he was a real pioneer. He insisted on maintaining Jewish national, national identity. For example, they worshiped on Saturday, on Shabbat, and they kept kosher. And uh, when I was involved in a Messianic congregation, we worshiped on Shabbat, on Saturday. Not because we had to, but because theologically we could. We were free to worship whenever, wherever, whenever we wanted to worship and we wanted to identify with the Jewish community. And so we worshiped on Shabbat. Again, it was voluntary on our part. It was done for cultural reasons, to help strengthen our witness to our Jewish neighbors. Uh, and that's why, that's why um, Joseph Rabinowitz did it as well. He always was very clear. He was always very, very clear in saying he did not, he did it for national identification, not for theological purposes or reasons, national identification. Now, he was a great preacher and he was an evangelist. He was so significant in his day that D.L. Moody brought him to America to preach at the Chicago World's Fair. So his movement was a great movement, but it died. But when he died, 
when he died, he began to weaken. And that's often the case when a vigorous leader um, dies and moves, along, moves on. Uh, people who take his place are not nearly as, uh, as uh, devoted or uh, knowledgeable or enthusiastic about, the, about the, the movement. So it began to weaken. Then, then in 1903, there came riots and pogroms against the Jews of Kishinev, and the movement folded completely. Now here's a pic picture of five of 49 victims of the Kishinev pogrom. It's a very, very sad picture. On the left, you can see a woman, the body of a woman. And then as you move right, you see the body of three small children. And to the right of the last child is a man. So let me submit to you, this is probably a family, a whole family that, that died in the pogrom. Very, very sad, very, very sad uh, situation. Now there were others who were influenced very highly by Rabinowitz, other voices that supported him. Significantly, Mark Levy, a leader in the Hebrew Christian Alliance, promoted the idea of Hebrew Christian churches. But his views were tabled by the Alliance. They rejected him out of fear. Fear of raising the middle wall of partition. Again, you know, us and them. Them, they're the Gentiles, us, we're the Jews. We Jews stay in our congregation, and them Gentiles, you know, you go over into your own congregation. You know, that would not be a very good situation to have. That's a genuine concern, this separation attitude that could develop. And it's a genuine concern even today, even today. I have heard it. I've heard Jewish believers have this us and them attitude. No, they, they, they can go to their, their Christian church. We'll, and we're in our Messianic congregations. It's really kind of arrogant, and it speaks against the unity of the body of Messiah. We should never take up that kind of an us and them attitude. So they were re rejected him out of fear of that occurring. But also, the many Jewish missionaries of the Alliance were fearful of losing support financially from the Gentile churches. You know, if they started their own church, they'd probably lose their supporters. So they were afraid of doing that. So that was an impact upon the alliances. All right, let's move on to, the, to look at the early congregations. And we want to look at the first Hebrew Christian church. And the very first one was the first Hebrew Christian church of New York City in 1885 founded by Jacob Freshman, Jacob Freshman. Another precursor, another early one, was the Sar Shalom Congregation of Christian Jews in 1897. This congregation was founded by Rabbi Leopold Cohen. He was the founder of Chosen People Ministries, very same man. He started this little congregation in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, New York. He was persecuted and attacked for doing so. Opposition accused him of being a swindler in Hungary. They accused him of being a swindler here in America. So he had tremendous attacks against him and threats on his life. And uh, his autobiography is available through Chosen People Ministries to an ancient people, the autobiography of Rabbi Leopold Cohen. So that'd be well worth reading, uh, well worth picking up that little booklet and adding into your library. He was quite, quite a man. All right, the next congregation we want to look at is the First Hebrew Christian Presbyterian Church of Chicago, uh, led by David Bronstein in 1934. Uh, this this uh, church became known as the Penile Center, and finally it became known as Adat HaTikva, which exists today in Chicago. So Adat HaTikva has a long history going back to 1934. All right, let's take a look now at some modern Messianic congregations. First one we want to mention is Beth Messiah in Cincinnati, formed in 1960. He was led by Martin Chernoff. He was the father of Joel Chernoff of Lamb and David Chernoff, the pastor of Beth Yeshua. He was a missionary with the American Association for Jewish Evangelism. Now, today, there are over 680 Messianic congregations in North America, and the numbers are still growing. So let's look at the current status. Yes, today, there are over 680 
Messianic congregations in North America, and the numbers are growing. Some are very small, and so really are no more than a Bible study, but they call themselves congregations. Now, what's the worship style of these congregations? The worship style in Messianic congregations varies greatly. Some are very, very rabbinic. It's like going to a synagogue, and you might not even know you are among a body of Jewish believers, very rabbinic. And some, and may I even say most, are very charismatic and equate charismatic expression with Jewishness, and they call it messianic. It's really just charismatic expression of worship, and I'm not saying that this is bad or this is wrong, it's just what it is, this is the facts. It's charismatic and not Jewish. Jewish. For example, if a messianic congregation gives a clap offering to the Lord, that's charismatic, that's not Jewish. I mean, I've never seen a clap offering in a synagogue. You think you see a clap offering in a synagogue? No, no, it's charismatic, not Jewish. Well, then there are other Messianic congregations that are not charismatic in style. These, uh, there are some who chose to be like, you know, Baptist pap pastors with a Jewish pastor, Baptist churches with a Jewish pastor. And this style is adopted to target secular Jews. These congregations emphasize a national expression rather than a liturgical expression of Jewishness. Now to target secular Jews, these congregations attempt to express their faith in a Jewish way, but not through Jewish liturgy. They include elements like Messianic uh, music, uh, relevant preaching and teaching, perhaps a Shabbat service with candles and wine and challah, but it's not a, a genuine, real, liturgical Torah service. It's somewhere in between. So these styles vary. And you know, in my testimony, in my background, uh, our Messianic congregation was one of these in-between congregations. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I was the, I was the uh, elder and primary teacher in a Messianic congregation for seven years. And theologically, what are Messianic Jews? Well, we're just born again, Believers, we're just people born again by the Spirit of God, but we happen to be Jewish in our family uh, background. We're, we're Jewish, so, and, uh, and as a result, we're all biblical, and we have all the variations found in conventional congregations. You know, so you can't, you can't get down on a Messianic congregation because they're charismatic, because there's very plenty of Gentile charismatic congregations around, et cetera, et cetera. We, we have all the variations found in the conventional churches. But one thing I discovered is that 50% of the Jewish believers are at home in the, con the conventional congregation. And I also, and the other 50% are at home in Messianic congregations, you know, so there's a place for both, for both the Messianic congregation and the conventional congregation. But if you're in a congregation, a, a conventional congregation, uh, Try, try your best to maintain a connection with the Jewish community, with your heritage, with your background. Because that's the greatest problem that I discovered when I was a, a Messianic pastor, Messianic elder, and that was identity. Identity was the biggest problem. First, with the Jewish believers. Many Jewish believers had to get over thinking that they were no longer Jewish. You know, that's what they were told by the rabbis. You believe in Yeshua, Jesus? Oh, you're no longer Jewish. Get out of here get out of here, you're no longer Jewish, you know? Go to them, go over to them, those Christians who want to kill us or convert us, you know, that kind of a thing. You can get ostracized. And so many Jewish believers think that they uh, accept Jesus, they're no longer Jews, you know? And that's the number one unspoken reason a Jewish person will, accept to, will hesitate to accept Yeshua. So if you're talking to your Jewish friend, you're telling him about Yeshua, he may be intrigued, but what's going on in the back of his mind? In the back of his mind, silently, he's thinking, yeah, yeah, it sounds good, but I don't want to stop being Jewish. I don't want to be one of them Christians. I love being Jewish. I don't want to stop being Jewish. So maybe I better not accept Jesus. We see, that's the, that's the thing. You've got to show them that, that uh, accepting Jesus is the most Jewish thing you can possibly do. You know, I could care less about my, my Jewishness when I was a teenager and a college student. But once I accepted Yeshua, once I saw that the Bible was our book, a Jewish book, all of a sudden, being Jewish became very, very important to me. Beforehand, didn't mean much. I tell people, Jesus made me Jewish. 
Afterwards, being Jewish meant a lot to me. And so uh, you, have to, you have to instill a good definition of Jewishness into the minds of some Jewish believers. And you can, using the Bible, don't use rabbinics, you know, rabbinic opinions all over the place. Uh, you, can, you, know, you, you can be Jewish if you wear a kippah. Uh, and you're Jewish if you go to Shabbat once in a while or High Holy Days, you know. Uh, basically, if you're born Jewish, you're going to die Jewish. doesn't matter what you believe or what you do. And that's correct. That's correct. But they, they won't tell you that. All right, well, let's go into the Bible for a definition, of, uh, a definition of Jewishness. And you can determine the definition of Jewishness from the Abrahamic Covenant and the progression of the Abrahamic Covenant. It started by God giving the covenant, making the covenant with Abraham. And then Abraham passed it on to Isaac, not Ishmael, passed it on to Jacob, also known as Israel, not Esau, and Jacob passed it on to all 12 tribes. Now from that progression, we can derive the definition of who is a Jew. The biblical definition, a Jew is a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It is a family relationship, a family relationship. And um, that's one thing you you, uh, one thing you cannot do is lose your Jewishness because you're part of a family. If you are born into ABC family, you'll die a member of ABC family because your genes don't change. Who you are doesn't change. You may do some silly stuff and you may walk away from your family and you may desert them and or vice versa, but you're still a member of the family. You can't lose your Jewishness. And the rabbis know this, but they still threaten you with with um, expulsion and loss of Jewishness. Now, uh, if you look in the Bible, we the Jewish people were disobedient uh, many, many times. But never during one of those periods of disobedience did God ever say, you're no longer Jewish, okay? And we can, we can support this definition of Jewishness and the fact that it's permanent from many sections of scripture in the Bible. I'm just gonna choose one here. And the one I've chosen is Amos 3, verses 1 and 2, which reads, Hear this word which the Lord has spoken against you, sons of Israel, sons of Jacob. You know, he's speaking to all 12 tribes there. Against the f entire family which he brought up out of the land of Egypt. Who did he bring out of the land of Egypt? The Jewish people. You only have I chosen among all the families of the earth. So we're part of the chosen family. And that means we cannot lose our Jewishness. Now, as far as this idea of disobedience goes, in the Bible, we're never told that we are no longer Jewish when we're disobedient. God says just the opposite. He says, therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. So God says, because you're Jewish, I'm going to punish you. You know, because we, we are going uh, against, against his uh, covenant. All right, well, that's uh, enough on that. I think, I hope uh, if uh, you're Jewish and you're wondering about your identity, I hope you'll take, you'll take um, comfort in the fact you can't lose your Jewishness because it is a family relationship. Now, the other issue is Gentile believers who want to be Jewish. And we call them the Jewish wannabes. And they're in every congregation. We had a, a few in our congregation. One fella grew pay us the side locks. He started wearing a white shirt and black, black pants. He put a yarmulke on his head all the time, grew a beard, etc. You'd think he was an Orthodox Jew, but he wasn't. He wasn't. He was a Gentile. So Gentiles want to be Jewish, but they cannot become Jewish. Gentile believers are grafted in to the place of blessing. They're grafted into the place of blessing. They share all the Jewish blessings of the Bible, but they are always referred to as proselytes in the Bible, never referred to as Jewish people. You know, the rabbis might perform conversion ceremonies, but in the Bible, Gentiles are always called proselytes. They're not recognized as members of the family of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right, all right, enough of that, enough of that. Uh, so there are three approaches uh, these uh, congregations take, uh, rabbinic approach, charismatic approach, and then something in between. So let me now recap, recap the chronological historical perspective. First, Jewish missions started. The Jewish people were one, but the Jewish identity was lost. 
So then there were Jewish Christian associations that grew out of that where Jewish identity was kept, but the children's identity was lost. And these exist still today, known as the International Messianic Jewish Alliance and the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. And from there, the Jewish Christian associations led to the formation of Messianic congregations where Jewish people could be one, and Jewish identity could be kept, and Jewish children one to the Lord and keep their identity. So that's the progression. All right, let's now move to the contemporary scene. And what's the Messianic movement like currently? Well, let's begin with the history. There was a modern revival between the years 1967 and 1973 that got it all going. Now the reasons, there were three reasons for this revival. The Spirit of God used three, three factors. First factor was the American Jewish experience. The experience was basically the American Jewish experience was basically the bar mitzvah factory. The synagogue simply ground out their bar mitzvah boys and their bat mitzvah girls. Jewish kids went to Hebrew school, learned Hebrew without knowing it, and that was about it. You know, and that was my experience as well. I took Hebrew as an adult. You know, after I became a believer, being Jewish was very important to me, so I went and started spending time at, an, <clears throat> at a, um, not a reform, a conservative synagogue uh, in my, near my home. And I started attending all the adult education classes I could get myself to. And one of those was Hebrew. And I enjoyed the class and I began to learn Hebrew. And the teacher was an Israeli and she was very nice and very, very competent. But there was one big drawback. The synagogue and the teacher were only concerned that we fluently sounded out the words. They did not care if we knew the meaning of the words. They just wanted us to be able to read the prayer book in Hebrew smoothly. It didn't matter if you, to them it did not matter if we didn't know what we were reading. They just wanted us to read smoothly, you know. So that, uh, not knowing what you're reading does not build, a, not a good foundation for spiritual growth. So that's what was happening to these kids as well. The bar mitzvah and the bat mitzvah was the last touch with the synagogue or with Judaism, except perhaps for high holy day services. And by, by the time these kids left their teens, there wasn't much of a Jewish identity except for bagels and locks. You know, and that was my experience as well. When I was a teenager, remember I told you I was having an argument with my mom, and she said, but you're Jewish, but you're Jewish. And I don't know what the argument was about, but the reasoning she gave me just floored me. What does that have to do with anything? So what if I'm Jewish? Well, mom, what does that mean? Does that mean we, we to speak Hebrew? We don't. Does that mean we go to the synagogue? We don't. Does that mean we live in Israel? We don't. Does that mean I have Jewish genes in my blood? Ugh. Little known to me, unbeknownst to me at that time, I had actually happened upon the correct definition. <clears throat> but I had, Jeff and I had Jewish genes in my blood. So what? What did that have to do with anything? You know? Our, the religious affiliation of many Jewish young people was negligible, just like me. Our spiritual identification was absence. So there was a great spiritual barrenness in the lives of Jewish youth in the 60s, in my life and in many others. Materialism was rampant, spiritual life non-existent. So that's the American Jewish experience. Now the second factor in the revival was the counterculture. In the 60s, the counterculture developed, which would be summed up in this phrase, question authority. This is one of the basic elements. There was a radical, radical break with the status quo. People started experimenting with taboo areas like premarital sex, drugs, Eastern religions, and Jesus, and Jesus. You see, Jewish youth, for the first time, were willing to experiment in these areas. Now, their parents would die. They would die if they knew what they were experimenting with, experimenting with, but they did it anyway. This was the baby boom generation. So they were experimenting with all this stuff, all the two taboo areas, but most important, Jesus. And then the third factor in the revival was the Six Day War. When Jerusalem was reunited, it caused all kinds of eschatological speculation among Jewish people. And right alongside the Six Day War and the reunification of Jerusalem, a book was published called The Late Great Planet Earth. It became very popular. Uh, <clears throat> it was written by Hal Lindsey, written by Hal Lindsey. The book was given to thousands of Jewish young people and it caused them to consider the prophetic 
future of Israel. And I read the book too. <laughs> I remember it very well. It was, it was very, very common. It was really the thing to read in those days. So these three factors came together. The lack of spiritual life in the American Jewish community, the counterculture willing to experiment with what was taboo, and the Six-Day War leading to eschatological speculation, the prophetic future of Israel. This caused a tremendous revival of which there's never been seen since the first century in the Jewish people. And the impact, the impact was felt in two areas. <clears throat> Suddenly, there were Jewish believers with a strong Jewish identity in great numbers, and they developed a Jewish expression of faith. For example, there was Messianic music. Groups came into existence like Jews for Jesus, the Liberated Wailing Wall. We loved these guys when they would come around to our churches. Brand new, fresh stuff, new music from a Jewish perspective. We loved it. The churches loved it. And uh, they produced albums and everything else. There's one of their, their favorite uh, albums, one of their albums. Then another... Another group was Israel's Hope. This was my particular favorite group. I love these guys. And then there was Lamb. Lamb was a little bit too rock and rolly for me, but they were very popular at that time as well. Now, another Jewish expression of faith that emerged was Hebrew folk dancing becoming part of worship. Now, the, the charismatic churches, the charismatic-oriented churches, called it Davidic dance. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just Jewish folk dance integrated into the service, uh, both through formal presentations like this one up front or through normal congregational practice. And we had Messianic dance in our Messianic congregation as well. And I feel it is a very, very valid worship form. And if you wonder about that or disagree with me, go to Psalm 149 and 150, which both say, praise the Lord in the dance. So I think it's a very worship, very valid worship form. All right, praise the Lord in the dance. Okay, another element in this Jewish expression of faith were literature and books. Messianic Judaic, Judaica resources just simply exploded. Resources like the Messianic Jewish Movement's International Catalog and Letterer Messianic Ministries. And here's the Letterer Messianic Ministries current website. There's the address if you'd like to at all get in touch with them and, and avail yourself of their, their, um, their resources. My notes are getting kind of stuck together here. And then there was uh, Purple Pomegranate Productions, and this was the marketing arm of Jews for Jesus. This is uh, their books, part of their website. And there's the address if you'd like to contact J4J and see what books they might have available for you. So that's a, a resource available for you. So Messianic Jews were producing, were producing uh, artwork and jewelry and Judaica and songbooks and liturgy and teaching curriculum, all from a Messianic perspective. And then a newspaper, a newspaper, the Messianic Times, began in Toronto, Canada. And there's the website of the Messianic Times. There's their website address at the top of the page. Now, the Times struggled through many trials and tribulations, but it served to inform and unite Messianic Jews and interested Gentiles regarding the current events affecting Israel and the Messianic Jewish movement. So, there was a Jewish expression of faith. But there was also a Jewish concern for Jewish evangelism. Many Jewish believers, as they historically had done, entered missionary or congregational service. Jewish believers entered service as missionaries and began to reach to the community in a new, effective way. And that's what happened with me as well. Uh, my pastor brought in Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum of Ario Ministries for his five-day um, prophecy conference. And that prophecy conference showed me that we Jews were in trouble. We were heading in, in, into trouble. We were heading into the Great Tribulation and into an eternity in hell. It was pretty, pretty eye-opening. So I asked the Lord, you know, what do you want me to do about it? What do you want me to do it? How can I get involved in this? Well, eventually, in a year or so, I uh, started the first uh, volunteer office of REO Ministries in my home. And from there, <laughs> I ended up going to seminary, and uh, from there, uh, getting into full-time Jewish missions. So I've been into full-time Jewish missions now. How long now? About 30 years. I'm still in it. I'm retired. I'm semi-retired, I guess. Still doing these videos for Hadavar Messianic Ministries. So I'm following the path of many Messianic Jews. 
All right, let's take a look at some significant organizations. Now, I don't mean to say that there aren't other organizations that are significant, but there are some major organizations I'd like to mention. Okay, and just because I mention an organization doesn't mean I'm endorsing it. I am informing, not endorsing in this class, except for REL Ministries. I unashamedly endorse them. So let's start with missions, and we, with missions we start in 1894 with uh, Chosen People Ministries. And here is their website. Here's their, their current website. And uh, this is their address if you'd like to get involved with Chosen People Ministries. Uh, here you can go to their history page. Uh, these pages, and here's the address, by the way, of the history page. And this history page will tell you about CPM's philosophy, philosophy a little bit about the ministry and about uh, CPM's current uh, president, Mitch Glazer. Let's move on to 1973 and the formation of Jews for Jesus. Here is their current website, and this is their address if you'd like to contact Jews for Jesus and get involved with them. Now, in terms of missions, Jews for Jesus is probably the most significant organization in terms of size. It's probably the biggest. It was founded in 1973 by Moish Rosen. And JFJ is characterized by confrontational evangelism. They use many creative methods, such as broad track, broad, broadsides, excuse me, broadsides, street, street, drama, street drama, and music, that kind of thing. All right, let's move on to 1977 and REL Ministries. And this is a third organization that I think is very, very significant today. Here is the Ariel Ministries website, their current website, their homepage. And there's the address if you'd like to go to Ariel and get involved uh, with them. Their founder and CEO for 47 years was Dr. Arnold G. Fruchtenbaum. And so I, I worked for Arnold for 20 years. I was part of Ariel Ministries for 20 years. And here is uh, the Arnold's testimony. You can read all about Arnold at this address at the bottom of the page. Well, in, 19, in 2024, excuse me, in 2024, which is this year, Arnold uh, moved from full-time status to, I guess you would call it, semi-retired status with REL Ministries. He um, turned over the duties of Chief Executive Officer to a new CEO, and that is Dr. Tim Sigler. So Dr. Tim Sigler uh, leads the ministry today. And you can read all about Tim, and there's the address of his testimony at the bottom of the page there. Now, Ariel is not a large organization, but because of Arnold's tenacious adherence to teaching biblical truth, Ariel Ministries experiences a worldwide impact with offices in the USA and around the world. And here are some of their, here are some of the ministries of Ariel Ministries. First of all, the Ariel College of the Bible, and Messianic Jewish Studies. You can get online courses from Ariel Ministries of all different levels, from uh, credit courses to, um, to uh, let's see, when you just audit the course, yes, credit courses to audit courses. So if you want to take an online course, you can sign up with Ariel Ministries as well. Now, if you'd like to go to their Shoshana campus in Upper New York State, you can attend the School of Messianic Studies at the Shoshana campus. Uh, Camp Shoshana in Upper New York State is a wonderful place for a family to relax and enjoy the Adirondack Mountains and Bible study at the same time. So if you come to Camp Shoshana, and I think it's a six-week program at this point, maybe a little bit bigger, um, you would receive your lectures in Haney Hall, which is the main lecture hall and chapel, and you'll study with approximately 80 other students. Uh, you'll make new friends, you'll learn the Bible in depth, and uh, conservatively from a Jewish perspective. So I, I've spent many years, I, 15, for 15 seasons, I have taught at Camp Shoshana, and it's a great ministry, so I recommend it very, very highly. Now, if you can't get, a, can't get to Camp Shoshana, and uh, all you can do is um, you know, buy some resources, then I would advise you to go to the Ariel store. And there's many categories of, of literature you can get at the Ariel store. Uh, you can uh, pick up books. You can get uh, Bible book stories. You can get evangelism tools and uh, Messianic Bible studies. 
and you can study systematic theology. Uh, lots of material there for you. In fact, I would advise you to go to the <clears throat> home page and click on this link download product catalog and that will put you in touch with all the all the material that RELL has to offer all of it solid evangelical conservative in depth from a Jewish perspective now i could sum up my perspective with this sentence there's a lot of junk out there there's a lot of discipleship junk floating around the messianic movement even today but Ariel Ministries is committed to producing high quality, sound biblical material. Now, much of the material that I teach and use comes from Ariel Ministries. And much of it is better than I received in seminary. And I went to a good seminary. An outstanding example is the Life of the Messiah material. You can get the Life of the Messiah in book form, in electronic form. You can take it at the Ariel College, or you can take, it at the, take a course at Camp Shoshana. The life of Messiah that Arnold teaches is head and shoulders above what I received even in seminary, even in seminary. It's also head and shoulders above most of the teaching that claims to be material about the life of the Messiah. So I recommend it highly. It changed my life, that's for sure. So I could go on and on and on, and I have, but Ariel produces quality discipleship material that's being translated into a number of languages and being used all over the world. Now, as far as evangelism goes, Ariel uses whatever method fits the missionary, confrontational evangelism, congregational planning, whatever, you name it. Whatever is ethical, whatever works, whatever fits the missionary style is eligible to be used. So that's a quick overview of Ariel Ministries, and I recommend their material highly and without reservation. I guess you know that by now. All right, let's move on. Let's move on to 1980 and the LCJE. That stands for the Lausanne Consultation on Jewish Evangelism. And here is their address if you've got like to get uh, uh, in touch with them. This is an outgrowth of the Lausanne Conference on World Evangelism. It's an association of various people in Jewish work who meet yearly to plan and try to work together. And as you scroll down through the website, you will learn about them. You will learn about their five goals. You'll learn about their resources. All right, let's move on to 1938 and Friends of Israel. This is the fifth group. Here is their current home page. And this is the address of Friends of Israel, if you'd like to get involved with them. They got founded by a group of men in 1938, and among their founders was Louis Sperry Chafer, 1871 to 1952, and Henry A. Ironside, 1876 to 1951, both both uh, bright and shining lights in the evangelical world. Its distinctive is church ministries, teaching churches to do Jewish evangelism and encouraging the local church to reach out to Jewish people and supporting Israel. They support Israel. So they're very, very good at church ministries. They're dispensational in viewpoint. In viewpoint. So uh, scroll down the home page and you'll find out why they exist. You'll get updates from them and events that they sponsor, things like that. All right, let's move on to 1887 and AMF International. We talked about them earlier under the heading, the Chicago Hebrew Mission. They are now known as Life in Messiah. And here's the website address of, of uh, the website, the homepage of Life in Messiah. And here is their website address. <coughs> and as you uh, rummage through that uh, website, You'll find the reasons for existence, you'll find uh, resources, and you'll learn about their mission. All right, 19, uh, 1963, Messianic Jewish Movement International. This is their home page, the MJMI, and their address. You scroll down through this re website, you'll learn about their, their goals, their vision, their values, they all give you, you can find some teaching pages and stores with, a store with resources for you. So, the world of Jewish missions is very much alive and well currently. And so I've only talked with about just a few of the organizations that are out there. What's so encouraging about the large number of organizations is the fact that many of them are founded by Jewish people who want to reach the community from a Jewish perspective. And the result, they are being very, very effective. 
All right, let's move on to associations of individuals. We'll start with the Messianic Jewish Alliance. The uh, Hebrew Christian Alliance changed its name in the early 70s. After debate, it became the Messianic Jewish Alliance. They changed not only name, their name, but their approach. The approach is the development of Messianic congregations and a charismatic expression of faith. Now, the American branch of the MJAA was most noted for the Messiah Conference, which is held every year in Pennsylvania at Messiah College. Now, here is their home page, and there is the address if you'd like to get in contact with the MJAA. Again, you look around through the, the um, uh, website, and you'll learn about their project pages. Uh, you'll get news, and it, they'll describe the events that they sponsor. Now, their youth work is called the Young Messianic Jewish Alliance, and here's their home page and the address of the Young Messianic Jewish Alliance. This is an attempt to instill a Jewish identity in the upcoming generation and not repeat the mistakes of the past. All right, now let's move on to associations of congregations. Uh, 1973 the Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations. Uh, here is their home page, the UMJC, and their address. And again, as you look around throughout this, uh, this website, you will find uh, pages about their history, their values, and their beliefs. Now, most of their churches are, congregations are charismatic in worship style but they have an uh, emphasis on rabbinic approach as well. Now, 1986, the Fellowship of Messianic Congregations got started. It was an as association put together by Chosen People Ministries and REL Ministries, putting congregations together that, that were not comfortable with the charismatic approach of the other organizations. They had a non-charismatic, non-rabbinic, but strong Jewish identity approach, and unfortunately it was discontinued, I believe it was, in 1998. And then there's the International Alliance of Congregations and Synagogues. There's the I, IAMCS. This is, group is charismatic and rabbinic as well. There's their, their homepage, and there's their address if you'd like to get in touch with them. And you'll learn of their purpose. You'll learn that they uh, are interested in ordination and licensing of Messianic rabbis. They can help you find a Messianic congregation and they will tell you about their conferences. They're associated with the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America. Now, the uh, next one is the Southern Baptist Messianic Fellowship. The, Mes uh, the Fellowship of Messianic Congregations did not uh, continue, but the Southern Baptist Messianic Fellowship did get formed in 1990. Here is their website, and there is their address if you'd like to get involved with them. This is an association of congregations put together by Jewish believers who are involved in the Southern uh, Baptist Convention. They produce the newsletter, they hold yearly training sessions in conjunction with the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, they state that their congregations are varied in expression from highly Talmudic to virtually assimilated. And their goal is, quote, to plant and to nurture authentically Jewish Messianic congregations, as well as aid our more Hebrew Christian brethren toward a confidently Jewish expression of Messianic faith. Now, significantly, the uh, Southern Baptist Convention passed a resolution affirming the validity of Jewish evangelism during the Southern Baptist Convention of June 11th to 13th, 1996. The resolution was not aimed at the Jewish community per se, its intention was primarily aimed at repudiating contemporary theologies that state that either the church has replaced Israel or the Jewish people do not need the gospel. Where the church has not replaced Israel and Jewish people definitely need the gospel. So scroll through their website, you'll get a list of congregations, there's a lot of them. You'll get a list of ministry resources, and then they do work in humanitarian areas and in the Holy Land. Uh, 1995, <clears throat> the International Federation of Messianic Jews. Now, currently, their website is being rebuilt. So click, this is their address. If you go to their website, you'll find that it's being rebuilt. And if you click on the menu at the top of the website, you'll get more information about them. 
Now, in the middle of the website there, in the middle of the home page, they state that they're changing their name from the IFMJ, the International Federation of Messianic Jews, to the International Federation of Sephardic and Ashkenazi Jews, the IFSAJ. And they're very Sephardic in orientation. The president is Chaim Levy. He founded this organization in 1995 because he saw a need to bring the Messianic Jewish message to the large masses of Sephardic Jews in the dispersion. This need encompasses Spanish, Portuguese, and French-speaking Jews living in such areas as France, Central and South America, Spain, and Portugal. So a ministry within the IFSAJ is the IFMJCS, the IFMJCS, the International Federation of Messianic Jewish Congregations and Synagogues. This group provides networking for like-minded congregations to work together for the purpose of reaching the Sephardic Jewish community. All right, I see I've run out of time. I see I've run out of time, so this is a good place to turn our attention to the Messianic movement in Israel, which we will do next session. This we will do next session. So I'll say, uh, Thanks again for being our students. We'll you see you when we'll see you when we start up again looking at what's happening in Israel. So, Lahitro, take care. Lahitro, Lahitro.